Ryszard Kuklinski, codenamed Jack Strong, a Polish and American hero, helped the United States defeat Soviet Russia. In Moscow, he obtained top secret plans for Red Army aggression in Europe. He prevented the outbreak of the Third World War, in which Poland was to have become a nuclear wasteland, and Polish soldiers cannon fodder for the Russian marshals. Sentenced to death by the communists, he was exonerated by Free Poland. His life and activities in the year 1971 to 1981 represent the most important intelligence mission of the Cold War. Measured by political and military consequences, he was the most important US intelligence agent of the 20th century. Colonel Kuklinski, posthumously promoted to general, risked his life and the lives of his family by making difficult decisions. He was possessed not only of military courage, but also ordinary civil courage too. In Moscow, he gained possession of strategic plans for Soviet aggression towards Western Europe and NATO states, which he then handed to the Americans. These were in fact the plans for the unleashing of a third world war by the evil communist empire. By providing these plans to the Americans, General Kuklinski helped the United States to win the Cold War. This has been confirmed not only by the political, military and intelligence authorities of the United States, but also by Soviet marshals and generals. For the Poles, a Third World War would have been a catastrophe, regardless of its outcome. General Kuklinski, head of the Strategic Defense Planning Department of the General Staff of the Polish Army, was also the secretary of the Polish delegation to meetings of the Warsaw Pact, as well as the liaison officer between Red Army Command and the Polish People's Army. Ryszard Kuklinski said, The efforts of the United States meant that the world avoided a nuclear holocaust, which Moscow included in its strategic plans. The knowledge of what would happen should war begin was overwhelming. For years I had been sticking little mushroom symbols on the huge staff maps signifying nuclear explosions. Blue for the bombs to come from the west, red where ours were supposed to land. There is no doubt that Kuklinski broke his military oath of obedience to the Red Army and the Warsaw Pact. He was spurred to this course of action by the events of December 1970, when unarmed civilians were killed by regular Polish army units, representing Soviet and communist domination. This followed Warsaw Pact aggression in Czechoslovakia in 1968 and the presence of Soviet nuclear weapons on Polish territory. Kuklinski was then delegated by the General Staff to Red Army Command in Legnica to prepare the Polish contribution to the attack on Czechoslovakia. Feigning illness, however, he returned to Warsaw, where he tried unsuccessfully to inform Western tourists of the impending invasion of Czechoslovakia, which would be against the interests of all its participants. The one country standing to benefit from the suppression of the burgeoning freedom in Czechoslovakia was the Soviet Union. Czechoslovakia, 1968. The inhabitants held out great hopes for the political, social and economic changes to become known in history as the Prague Spring. The changes began in early 1968 and ended with the intervention of the armed forces of Warsaw Pact countries in August of the same year. Why did the Czechs and Slovaks have to fight for these changes? Why was it called the Prague Spring? The cause was rooted in the fact that, as a result of the decisions made by the great powers in Tehran, Yalta and Potsdam, Czechoslovakia, Poland, East Germany, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania had found themselves within the Soviet sphere of influence. In the years 1945 to 1948, Communism was imposed and implemented in these countries. Notably, the background and model for the introduction of communism to Czechoslovakia and Poland differed. 
In Czechoslovakia, the Communist Party operated legally in the interwar period. It was fairly strongly supported, and the Czechs and Slovaks had no negative historical experiences originating from being neighbors with Russia, Bolshevik Russia and the Soviet Union. In Poland, communism was imposed with the aid of Soviet armies. The NKVD, the UB, Polish secret police and violence. In 1948, the PPR and PPS, Polish Workers' Party and Polish Socialist Party, were forcibly merged to form a communist monoparty, the PZPR, the Polish United Workers' Party. In Czechoslovakia, it was an election year when a government dominated by communists from the KPCZ, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, was called into being. In the 1940s and 50s, communism in Czechoslovakia was similar to Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria or Romania. Catholic clergy were put on trial and agriculture was forcibly collectivized. However, it was not possible to achieve the latter in Poland due to peasant resistance. When Stalin died in March 1953, the process known as the thaw took place faster in Czechoslovakia than in Poland. Above all, this was a political thaw, a social one to a lesser extent, and minimally an economic one. In Poland, this process did not occur until 1956, and its symbols were June and October 1956. In the west of Czechoslovakia, in Pilsen in 1953, among other places, Workers' strikes took place, but they were above all the effect of the dynamics of political change in Czechoslovakia. At the beginning of the 1960s, Czechoslovakia was developing economically better than Poland. Social tensions in Czechoslovakia were mitigated by economic stabilization and the beginnings of personnel changes in the KPCZ. In Poland, hopes rose greatly when, in 1956, Władysław Gomułka came to power. By the end of the decade, these hopes had plummeted alarmingly. Polish society had been convinced that Gomułka wanted to reform the system, calling it communism with a human face or socialism with a human face. These turned out to be merely empty slogans, which Gomułka had no intention of enacting. The catalyzing event that sparked the changes in Czechoslovakia was the year 1967. It should be remembered that Czechoslovakia was a federation of Czechs and Slovaks, a situation that was different to Poland's. The constitution of this federation guaranteed the equality of the two nations, but in reality there was no such equality. There was and there is no equality under the communist system. The Czechs were much better funded, they were organized better and more efficiently. On the other hand, in Slovakia, there was a very strong sense of national identity. In contrast to the Czechs, among Slovaks, the Catholic Church was relatively strong, religion was strong. Another very important element that must be emphasized is that in 1967, when the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War was being waged in the Middle East, 
The Soviet Union instructed the so-called People's Democratic Countries to sever diplomatic relations with Israel. The attitude to the Six-Day War, the growing dissonance between Czechs and Slovaks, and the worsening economic situation became the catalysts for changes that began at the Czechoslovakian Communist Party summit at the end of 1967. The long-time party leader, Antonin Novotny, was forced out and new authorities were elected. Personifying the changes in which the Czechs and Slovaks put so much hope and expectation, was the newly elected first secretary of the KPCZ, Alexander Dubček. He was a Slovak. This fact reflected the changes that Czechoslovakia had decided upon. The political changes, taking place at the peak of power, had enormous popular support. For the first time in the history of Czechoslovakia since 1948, social organizations and even political groupings began to emerge. Initially, they operated in a very limited capacity, but organizations and groups abolished with the introduction of the communist system 20 years previously began to re-emerge. The changes encompassed all areas of the functioning of the state. The new minister of the economy was Ota Sik, identified by other politicians and economists in Czechoslovakia for being exceptionally pragmatic and economically minded. The strong support of the Czechoslovakian intelligentsia, the strong support of the workers, and the strong support of society gave the rulers of Czechoslovakia a full mandate for change. Unfortunately, as we all know, the functioning of individual countries within the communist system was dependent on the approval of Moscow, on the approval of Big Brother. It is worth noting that the initial reforms, those from the end of 1967 or early 1968, were accepted by Brezhnev in Moscow. Brezhnev and his circle came to the conclusion that it was better to permit the Czechs and Slovaks to make some minor changes under the auspices of the communist authorities than to allow a repeat of Poland in June and autumn of 1956 or Hungary in October and November of the same year. The leaders of other communist countries, among them Władysław Gomułka, first secretary of the Central Committee of the PZPR, anxiously observed what was unfolding beyond Poland's southern border. This anxiety existed because the Czechs and Slovaks were, in terms of political and economic reform, doing exactly what the Poles were counting on. One very interesting event to mention, in March 1968, when Polish students demanded the reinstatement of freedom of speech, meaning a limitation of censorship, the slogan appeared, Poland awaits its Dubček. Despite the fact that we were separated by a border consisting of a mountain range, information about the reforms in Czechoslovakia had reached Poland via broadcasters such as Radio Free Europe, 
The Czechs and Slovaks did not hide these changes, which is why the Polish communist leader, Władysław Gomułka, weakened by the protests of March 1968 in Poland, became one of the proponents for a forcible solution to the events in Czechoslovakia. Gomułka pressed Brezhnev to stop the counter-revolution in Czechoslovakia. The idea of counter-revolution arose in June 1956, when protests were suppressed in Poznan, and the changes that Hungary wanted to introduce in October and November 1956 were also dubbed counter-revolutionary. This boded ill for the Czechs and the Slovaks. Obviously, the Poles themselves kept their fingers crossed for the Czechs and Slovaks and hoped that if Czechoslovakia would prevail, maybe the same thing might happen here. In early 1968, at a meeting between Dubček, Gomułka, and the Hungarian head of state, Janos Kadar, it is likely that Dubček proposed to the Hungarian and the Pole that they introduced reforms together. This was extremely courageous. Unfortunately, the other two both slavishly reported this proposal back to Brezhnev. Counting on the fact that this display of loyalty would, above all, strengthen Gomułka's position in Poland. This is why it should be no surprise that, in March 1968, under Gomułka's influence, preparations began for external military intervention into Czechoslovakia. It is worth remembering that the changes in Czechoslovakia are called the Prague Spring of 1968. They were supposed to lead to the introduction of socialism with a human face into Czechoslovakia. In March, at a meeting of first secretaries of communist countries, the decision was taken to prepare joint military intervention. Obviously, Alexander Dubček was not informed. Even within the Communist bloc, even for the Warsaw Pact, the preparation of such an armed intervention was not a simple matter. Many now wonder whether a corresponding intervention by the Soviet Union into Poland to halt the growth of solidarity might have taken place in 1980 or 1981. The command of the Warsaw Pact armies realized that, in order to quell the spiraling changes in Czechoslovakia, at least half a million soldiers would need to enter the country with the appropriate logistics. Importantly, it was also necessary to identify people loyal to Brezhnev inside Czechoslovakia who would shoulder the responsibility, similar to Janos Kadar in Hungary in 1956. It was not easy, because the Czechs and Slovaks did not want an invasion. And a large part of the KPZZ party would simply not accept one. Meanwhile, in Poland, it was precisely in April 1968, that General Wojtek Jaruzelski became Minister of National Defense. The preparations for the introduction of Warsaw Pact armies, which the Polish army was to participate in, demonstrated who was trusted by Brezhnev 
and his Soviet comrades from the army faction and the KGB faction. Twelve years later, when preparing for the introduction of martial law, Jaruzelski would make use of his experience gained during the preparation to lead the Warsaw Pact armies into Czechoslovakia. In May, June and July 1968, a propaganda smear campaign against the Czechoslovakian authorities and Czechoslovakia began. Reading the Polish press at the time, a counter-revolution was threatening to tear Czechoslovakia away from the communist bloc. Gomułka warned that, as in 1939, the Germans would enter Czechoslovakia and we would again border Germany. What would that mean, according to Gomułka? Another war and the loss of the territories that we had received at the end of World War II. Thus were the Poles threatened. Did they believe it? I do not think so. All the historical studies indicate that the Poles preferred to wait for their own Dubček than be swayed by the propaganda of these slogans. This was also the role of propaganda. In June and July 1968, the armies of the Warsaw Pact countries conducted maneuvers, partly in Poland, where, as we know, the invasion of Czechoslovakia had been prepared. The attack was prepared in the Warsaw Pact General Staff at Legnica. Preparations were made for where the Warsaw Pact armies would be deployed, and it was decided that the forces to enter Czechoslovakia would be Soviet, Polish, Bulgarian and Hungarian armies. For a long time there was information, available after August 1968, that among these interventionist forces there were also East German units. But in fact, according to all sources, these East German units did not enter Czechoslovakian territory. It was feared that the Czechs would respond as the Hungarians had done, that is to take arms and to fight to preserve the reforms. On the night of the 20th to the 21st of August 1968, the forces of the Warsaw Pact entered Czechoslovakia and Operation Danube began. The armies crossed the border, the airport in Prague was occupied immediately, the television tower was taken, the radio station was taken, the nation's leaders were arrested. And what did the Czechs do? The Czechs undertook passive resistance. They did what they considered to be appropriate for them at the time. Symbols of this passive resistance were for instance, street names were altered, road signs were changed, people demonstrated, they shouted, go home. Note that in August and September 1968, the Polish army, over 24,000 soldiers strong, took part in the armed intervention in Czechoslovakia as part of Operation Danube. This was received very badly by the Czechs and Slovaks, for whom the Poles were the same as the Russians. It is hard to blame them for this. The Hungarians invaded from the south, but left Slovakian territory very quickly. Why? Perhaps simply because of the Hungarian minority who lived in the Hungarian-Slovakian borders. The Poles remained in Czechoslovakia until the middle of September 1968 and left a very poor impression behind. We had not allowed the Czechs and Slovaks to introduce their reforms. 
żeby przeprowadzili zmiany. Czy żołnierze mogli Could the soldiers have done otherwise? No, the soldiers had to obey orders. Nevertheless, the decision to include the Polish army among the Warsaw Pact armies entering Czechoslovakia was taken by Gomułka. And the plan was executed by Jaruzelski. It is hard to forget that many Czechs and Slovaks would have recalled Poland's occupation of Zaolzie. This had occurred in 1938, taking advantage of the difficult situation in Czechoslovakia post the decisions made in Munich. In 1968, it was said that the Poles were once again taking advantage of Czech difficulties and invading their southern neighbors. Today we know, on the basis of historical research, that Poles wrote letters of protest, posted flyers, and criticized the participation of Warsaw Pact armies and the Polish army in the invasion of Czechoslovakia. In September 1968, at the 10th anniversary stadium in Warsaw, during the State Harvest Festival, Richard Szywiec committed an act of self-immolation in protest at Polish army participation in the invasion of Czechoslovakia. In January 1969, in Prague's Wenceslas Square, Jan Palach committed the same act. He burned himself alive. These names symbolize the real stance of Poles, Czechs and Slovaks towards the August 1968 events in Czechoslovakia. This group also includes General Ryszard Kuklinski, who refused to participate in the preparations for the invasion, feigning illness. He tried unsuccessfully to warn the West of the plans being prepared by Red Army Command in Poland. It was only nine months later that he was able to begin his unprecedented nine-year mission, as a result of which he helped the United States defeat the Soviet Union.